Hello, and welcome to Lecture 30 on the topic of relativistic velocity, momentum, and energy. This is our final lecture on the topic of special relativity. This is a three-lecture a three series, 28, 29, and 30. This will conclude the last consequences of, of special relativity, that very simple idea that the laws of physics must apply universally to all inertial reference frames. So here we have it, our last few consequences. What happens to momentum? What happens to energy? And what about relative velocities? And what do I mean by that? Well, let's see. Okay, so here are our objectives up front. We want to learn how the velocity of an object depends on the frame of reference from which it is observed. Okay, that's what we should, that's what we should expect. That is, after all, Galilean relativity. We also want to learn how the theory of relativity modifies the relationship between velocity and momentum. And we want to practice how to solve problems involving work and kinetic energy for particles moving at relativistic speeds, because we've certainly done work in kinetic energy back in classical mechanics, but not at relativistic speeds, not correctly at least. And we all want to appreciate how the formulation of relativistic kinetic energy leads to the concept of rest energy, hmm, rest energy, and a rather famous equation, E equals mc squared. Okay, we'll get to that. Now I have this figure right here, this graph, that shows in the vertical axis translational kinetic energy, so this would be relativistic kinetic energy, one of the topics that we're going to be discussing in the next few minutes, graphed against velocity. Here we have velocity, a very special one, the speed of light, c. Let me zoom in a bit on this. So you can see Newton Newtonian mechanics gives us a parabola that crosses right across the speed of light, but we know that's impossible. So we cannot have velocities greater than the speed of light. Relativity, corrects for that based on Einstein's postulates, we know that there's no such thing as to get a velocity greater than the speed of light. So that means that the form of our functional relationship between velocity and kinetic energy, it's gotta be different. Kinetic energy can't just have a continuous form. It has to have a form that has a vertical asymptote. So we end up with this equation, right? We end up with an equation where the kinetic energy, you can see it's bigger and bigger, the closer and closer the velocity gets to the speed of light, approaching infinity. Okay, all right, so let's unpack that a bit, but first, define some key terms. So our upfront key terms are basically all about energy, as you can see. We have total energy, rest energy, and the principle, principle the conservation of mass and energy. So total energy is the energy of a particle or object that includes its kinetic energy and its rest energy, okay? And we're assuming a potential of zero, okay? So it's, you know, there's no, there's no included potential energy, so zero, potential energy. But this begs the question, what is rest energy? If we have an expression here that includes kinetic energy, you know, the energy of motion, and we're used to, you know, things like gravitational potential energy, but we're not talking about potential. Now there's a whole other type of energy. Is this chemical energy? What is rest energy? Not exactly. Rest energy is the energy possessed by a particle object when it has no kinetic energy, and again, assuming no potential. And where does it come from? Well, it's the energy of matter itself. It's created by the potential energy that holds matter together. Because after all, what is matter? Matter has to be built by some fundamental forces. And physicists have a pretty good idea of the fundamental forces that exist to hold matter together, such as the strong and weak nuclear force, which are not the topic of this lecture. But the idea is that that matter, then, since it is held together by potential energy, that energy can be released. And then energy can become kinetic energy, for example. Okay? So that's the rest energy of matter. All right? And certainly it has, that has big consequences on, consequences on fusion and fission, ideas of nuclear processes that release energy that we'll talk about later. But we definitely want to apply this idea of rest energy to the classical concept of conservation of energy, because we know that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It is one of the conserved quantities like momentum and angular momentum. And as such, it's very helpful for solving problems. Now we have another very helpful way of thinking about solving physics problems, and that is an extension of conservation of energy. That includes mass, converting to energy, and vice versa, energy converting to mass. And this is gonna be using that very familiar, famous equation, E equals mc squared. But not just throwing it out in some trivial way, but really showing where it comes from, from the basic postulates of Einstein's special relativity, okay? And do notice that I also, that I did say it goes both, way, both ways. It is in fact possible to convert energy to mass, just like it is possible to convert mass to energy. You can create electrons, for example, from photons. It has been done, it's a process, a physical process. Okay, and basically what the principle of conservation of mass and energy states, 
is that collectively, matter and energy are conserved. They can trade back and forth from one state to another, from matter to energy, but collectively it's conserved, which means we need to, of course, have a way to quantify how much matter gives you how much energy, and there is, okay? So let's then move on to our key formulas. So in a sense, we're gonna start with the most direct consequences of relativity and the material that's most familiar to lecture 29, and then we'll get into the, the more energy side and momentum side. So we're gonna start with this idea of relative velocity. Okay, now we've really been talking about relative velocity for a while because nothing about special relativity really matters until we have considered the S and S prime reference frames, the moving reference frame and the rest reference frame. So haven't we been talking about relative velocity the whole time? Yes, but it's always just been one reference frame relative to another. What if there is something moving in the moving re reference frame? So in other words, there's three velocities. Well, if there's three velocities, relativity gives you a different result than classical mechanics. Let's see why. So let's consider a rocket. The rocket is in the moving reference frame S prime. The rocket is moving at the velocity U. The rocket launches a projectile that moves with a velocity Vx prime relative to the moving reference frame. Okay, so Vx prime is the velocity of the projectile relative to the rocket. Okay. And the x is because this is a one-dimensional situation, and we'll keep these problems entirely 1D, okay? So the rocket is moving in the S prime frame at speed u, okay? Meanwhile, we have a person at rest in the rest frame S. So then the question is, what is the velocity of the projectile relative to the person at rest? Well, that's the kind of equations that we have here, all right? So first, we have the velocity relative to S prime, of an object like our projectile, all right? And we can see its relationship to the velocity in the rest frame, the velocity of the moving frame itself, which of course is u, then the velocity um, of light or the speed of light, okay? So this is the expression that relates the velocity relative to the s prime, s prime frame to the velocity of the frame itself and the velocity in s, okay? Now, if I was to include vx in this diagram, that would be, just the sum of these vectors classically, okay, because they're going in the same direction. But here we'll see that the actual sum, so we'll have this be our Vx vector, right? That's the velocity of the projectile relative to the person at rest, is not equal to just u plus Vx. See? Because classically it would be. You just take the length of those two vectors, again, because it's 1D, and that should give you the velocity of the projectile relative to the person but that's not the case anymore. We can't just simply sum them up like this. Instead, we have to have this expression that has a denominator, right? An actual fractional expression. Why? Well, because it has to be dependent on the speed of light, and we have to make sure that the result we get is never greater than the ultimate speed limit. And that's what this equation does, is it makes sure that we always get a velocity that's less than the speed of light, a relative velocity, okay? So this equation replaces the classical equation, Galilean relativity, and is derived from length contraction and time dilation, okay? So that's where it comes from. It comes directly from that idea of thinking about space-time coordinates, okay? Using length contraction and time dilation. We won't do a derivation here. The closest we'll do to a derivation is talking about relativistic kinetic energy, just to give you that confidence that these equations aren't coming from nowhere, and they are consistent with the classical laws we're used to. But let's move on to momentum, right? The next of our ideas in this lecture on relativity. Okay, so this right here is relativistic momentum. P is relativistic momentum. And relativistic momentum, unlike classical momentum, is not just equal to mv, because classically, momentum, represented by the letter P, is just mv, just mass times velocity. That was what momentum was, all right? But with relativity, that can't be the case, because then you could have a particle go faster than the speed of light, and we know we can't have that. So relativistic momentum has a Lorentz factor in it. Okay, so what we get then is we get a momentum, a relativistic momentum that approaches infinity as V approaches C, okay? So the momentum never ever actually allows for particles to move faster than C, okay? Because again, you know, if uh, otherwise we just calculate momentums for velocities or, you know, give a particle momentum, solve for the velocity that corresponds to that, that momentum and a certain mass, and the velocity you get would be greater than 300 millimeters per second, but that's physically impossible. 
So the beauty of this equation, of this relativistic momentum, is that by having that Lorentz factor, what happens to gamma as V approaches C? Gamma approaches infinity. So gamma goes to infinity as the velocity goes to C. And if gamma is going to infinity and you're multiplying MV by that Lorentz factor, then you have the momentum go to infinity as well. It's very similar to the graph that I showed you up here, except this graph was a different quantity going to infinity. It was kinetic energy. So we see that it's not just kinetic energy that approaches infinity as particles or objects velocity approaches C or the speed of light. It's also momentum. Okay, but that's a good segue to talking about energy because here we have relativistic kinetic energy, right? So there is relativistic momentum, same units, same physical quantity, it's Newton seconds, all right? But taking a look at relativistic kinetic energy, we have the same approach. Relativistic kinetic energy, just like momentum, approaches infinity as V approaches C, okay? Now, it doesn't approach quite at the same rate because you can see here there's just gamma, but with the uh, relativistic kinetic energy, it's gamma minus one, right? And you might wonder, you know, where, where does the equation come from? Well, it's not terribly easy to, to derive, but it does come, you know, directly from the algebraic expressions coming from length contraction. Just rather complicated algebra, to be honest. But we, what we will show is what happens if V is much, much smaller than C. Because if we take V to be much smaller to C, than C and plug it into this equation for relativistic kinetic energy, we'll get, we'll get back to classical kinetic energy. We'll get back to one half mv squared. And that's great because although it, we don't have a derivation of this formula that I'm going to show you, though you can certainly look one up, what it does is it gives you some confidence that this equation is consistent, right? As I said a moment ago. All right, so relativistic kinetic energy still measured in joules. And the last thing I want to say, just to, you know, just to reiterate a perspective on all of this, is both relativistic momentum and kinetic energy approach infinity because it is impossible for any matter to travel at the speed of light, okay? So that's an underlying idea that isn't completely inherent. You know, I mean, I, we, we know you can't catch up with the speed of light. We talked about that because that would then, you know, because inevitably then that would apply to different physics because then all of a sudden you, then I guess light is at rest relative to you and then you have no electricity and magnetism. But it is just a good thing to remember that you can never catch up to light Nothing with matter, no small, no small particle, no simple matter can catch up to light, right? Okay. And the energy equations certainly back that up. So the last thing I want to look at here is total energy. Total energy is going to be E, okay? So let's take a look, look take a minute on this. So total energy, still measured in joules, is kinetic energy plus this mc squared term. So it's relativistic kinetic energy. That's what K represents here. So it's, it's this gamma minus 1 times mc squared. All right, but then the second term gives us the rest energy. And that makes sense that total energy should be the energy of motion plus, plus the energy of matter itself, okay? That definitely makes sense. And again, this is assuming a potential energy, you can include potential energy, but you, know, you can consider a situation where there's no potential energy and this energy would still exist, okay? And what's great about it, since the relativistic kinetic energy is gamma minus one times mc squared, if you distribute that mc squared, then you end up with just gamma times mc squared for the total energy. So it's kind of an unusual thing. I, I, I think this is worth paying attention to because it's easy to mix up. The expression for total energy is actually simpler than the expression for relativistic kinetic energy, all right? And to be fair, this would be relativistic total energy, but you know, then again, it comes from relativity, okay? And we can rewrite this total energy expression using momentum, all right? Oh, well, first we'll take note that total energy approaches infinity as V approaches C, just as kinetic energy does. Because if kinetic energy is going up to infinity, then total energy must as, must as well, no matter how small rest energy is, okay? But then we can rewrite the total energy of a particle, or an object, but usually a particle, in terms of, in this way, we're going to square it because we're going to do a complicated substitution. It requires, again, quite a bit of algebra. But we can write that the total energy squared is equal to the sum of the rest energy squared, the, so the sum of the rest energy squared, because that's, that's what this is, is mc squared squared, okay, plus pc squared, where p is the relativistic momentum, okay? So p is the relativistic, relativistic momentum. And what's, what's so interesting about this expression is it allows us to do something, it allows us to consider light in a new way. Because if we take this expression for total energy and we plug in m equals zero, the, the idea that, that light can't have matter, in other words, photons, the particles of light, which we mentioned occasionally, right, throughout, throughout this lecture series, that those particles of light, they're massless, 
So if you plug in this expression, well, that means that first term goes to zero because you know it's just m of zero. So then you still see that there's total energy because photons obviously carry light or photons carry energy. And then that energy is related to momentum. See that? So that means that light, even though it doesn't have mass, still has momentum. So I find this quite amazing because if you think about the journey of special relativity, you think about a theory that was built on postulates that were just trying to reconcile that physics should work the same in all reference frames. But in doing so and following special relativity to its natural conclusion, we end up understanding light in a better way. We started with making sure that light worked the same everywhere and ended up with a better understanding of light, among many other findings of special relativity, many other conclusions. Because truly, this idea that light has momentum, even though it's massless, comes from special relativity. All right? And if that idea isn't terribly familiar, it is actually something we'll talk about in future lectures. We'll talk about the momentum of light quite extensively. All right? OK. So let's then move into our three types of problems to get some practice on these ideas of relativistic velocity, momentum, and energy. So the three types are going to represent velocity, momentum, and energy. Right? So we have problems that involve relative velocity measurements between frames of reference. These problems um, involve the velocity of moving reference frame S prime and some object moving relative to that moving reference frame. OK, all right. Type two, type two are problems that involve calculations of relativistic momentum. OK, type three are problems that involve calculations of relativistic kinetic energy and involve relating kinetic energy to the rest energy and total energy. Right. Not every single time, but that's something to be aware of. And that would definitely fall under the, these last two equations. OK, so let's start with our kind of proof of concept about our new expression for relativistic kinetic, relativistic kinetic energy. I want to show you that relativistic kinetic energy reduces to classical energy whenever the velocity is much, much less than c, right? And we already saw, you know, that in the previous lecture, the tiny percent errors, if you're moving at velocities that are, you know, normal everyday velocities and how relativity would just never show up in your measurements, certainly if you're moving at 35 meters per second. But if you're even moving at 8,000 meters per second, still relativity is going to have almost no effect on your calculations. So then we should then be able to return to an expression for the kinetic energy that to within you know, 12, 15 significant figures calculates the correct value. So how do we get there though? Because currently our expression for relativistic kinetic energy doesn't look that familiar to classical, right? It doesn't look like one half mv squared exactly. What's gonna happen to these c's? How do we cancel them out, okay? Well, to do it, we have to make an approximation. So first we're gonna factor out an mc squared, all right? We do that so we can have this expression in here, which we're gonna clean up by using the binomial approximation. We use the binomial approximation to look for the very small effects of relativity um, that show up at everyday velocities in lecture 29. But here, we're going to use it for a different purpose. And recall that the binomial approximation says that this term right here reduces to a sum of two terms as long as, so this is true, as long as v is much, much less than c. That's actually the condition that makes this approximation valid. But of course, that's exactly what we want. So it's the right approximation for the job, OK? So we're going to, once we do that and we substitute it in, then you see, so I, here are the, you know, there's no more raising things to the negative 1 half power. I've, already, I've made the substitution that allows the ones to cancel out nicely. And then, so then once we distribute the mc squared back in, ah, now we're able to cancel out the c squareds. And otherwise, there was no way to, because there's no common denominator, right? Or if, there, if we set it up, there, we'd still be stuck with the speed of light in our expression. But now it cancels out thanks to our approximation. And sure enough, our relativistic kinetic energy reduces to classical kinetic energy. OK? All right. So now our first example. Two electrons move in opposite directions at 70% the speed of light, as measured in the laboratory. OK? So those are both relative to s. The speed of one electron as measured from the other is what? OK? Because classically, which would be kind of, I guess, a combination of relativity and and, and classically, we would say, okay, well, if this one's moving this way at 70% the speed of light, and this one's moving this way at 70% the speed of light, then, you know, then relative to each other, it should be 1.4 C, right? But that's impossible. There's no way in any reference frame something can move at 1.4 times the speed of light. So what do we get? Well, we'll use our expression, all right, for it's Vx prime, all right? And let's think about what our variables represent in this case. Vx prime is the velocity of one electron relative to the rest frame, all right? Because Vx, um, or excuse me, Vx without the prime. So Vx is the velocity of one of the electrons relative to the rest frame, okay? 
And then this here is u, which is the velocity of the other electron relative to the rest of it. See? Because it's you can think of one of the electrons as being the s prime frame, and then the other other electron as being um, as being relative to the rest frame. Okay? And then we want the velocity relative to the other electron. Okay? So in other words, this is the correct expression to use. So hopefully those you can see see where these are coming from. And one is positive and the other is negative because they're going in opposite directions. All right, so once we substitute that in, then we go ahead, right, distribute our negative, and just we end up with a with the sum of 0.7 in the um, numerator and 1.7 in the denominator, which gives us 0.82c, not 1.4c. Nope. So that's interesting, right? So essentially summing 0.7 plus 0.7 in terms of relativity gives you 0.82, which is just a testament of that vertical asymptote. Right in a, in a in a broad sense, the one that we saw on the kinetic energy graph. As you approach the speed of light, you keep and then you keep like adding things to it. You have to add more and more to get that much little bit closer to the speed of light. Okay. On to our next example. In this one, we have an armada of spaceships. Okay. Oh, I forgot. I gave the actual velocity here. Excuse me for that. This is the actual velocity just by plugging in c being 300 millimeters per second. 2.82 times 10 to the eight. Or 282 million meters per second. Okay, all right. Now on to example two involving a spaceship armada, just a giant fleet of spaceships, right? Very sci-fi. This giant fleet of, of spaceships is one light year long, truly is monumental in size. And that's measured in its reference frame, all right? So this is the proper length, okay? And it moves at the speed of 80% the speed of light relative to a ground station in frame S, right? So it's passing by some planet, okay? So there you go. A messenger travels from the rear of the armada to the front with a speed of 95% the speed of light, also relative to that ground station. Okay, so we're given two velocities, both relative to the ground station. That's interesting, right? We gotta pay attention to that. How long does the trip take as measured in the rest frame of the messenger, in the rest frame of the armada, and by observer in the ground frame S? Because they're all measured different times thanks to time dilation and length contraction. So let's think about our notation. We're gonna call SM the frame of the messenger, M for messenger. So in SM, the velocity relative to the armada is gonna be V minus VM over one minus the product of V and VM over C squared, okay? So let's think about what these uh, variables represent. V is the velocity relative to the rest frame of the armada, okay? Then 0.95 is the velocity of the messenger relative to the rest frame. So you can notice the lack of primes. That means that they're relative to the rest frame. There's a consistency, consistency in our notation, see? All right, and same thing down here. The same two velocities, both relative to s, okay? So then we get this expression here, negative 0.625c. And what is that? That is the armada velocity relative to the messenger, okay? Okay, that makes sense because the messenger is going faster than the armada, right? You might think, oh, only 0.15 um, times faster, but no, actually, quite a bit faster, okay? Because that's the idea. You have to add this much of a fraction of the speed of light in order to go from 0.8 to 0.95. That's relativistic relative velocity for you, okay? Okay, so then we're going to find the length of the armada in this rest frame. Okay, and to do that, we just need to find the Lorentz factor that corresponds to that velocity. Okay, so that's all I'm doing here is I'm just using length contraction to find the armada as measured by the messenger because the armada length as measured by the messenger is not gonna be the same as its proper length, okay? So indeed, we're gonna have a contracted length based on this velocity, okay? The relative velocity between the messenger and the armada, and we find out that the messenger sees the armada as only being 0.781 light years long, okay? Contracted, just as we expect. So then we can find the time by just taking the length of the armada in the reference frame of the messenger divided by the velocity of the messenger relative to the armada. Okay, so that makes sense because we're matching up variables that go together, all right? And so then we find out that according to the messenger, it takes 1.25 years to travel from the rear to the front of the armada. Okay, all right, but what about the armada? How long would they measure the time, okay? Well, it should be longer because the person going fastest is the messenger relative to anyone. And so the messenger should have the least time passed. All the other reference frames should measure more time passed. So let's see if that's the case. 
Okay, so we're going to call the reference frame of the armada the, the armada S of A, and we're going to find the the velocity of the armada relative to the messenger. Okay, so we plug in our values here. Again, these are both relative to the S reference frame, and we get 0.625c. Oh well, that's nice because that's exactly what we should expect, really. The, mess the, the velocity of the messenger relative to the armada should be just the negative. Because after all that idea, we should be able to interchange between reference frames because there's, there's no special unique reference frame, right? The messenger is not a special unique re reference frame, neither is the armada. And so this fundamental relationship that one relative to the other is just the negative of the velocity relative to the first must still hold true. The actual values are affected by relativity because we can't have a speed greater than the speed of light, but this relationship must hold true, okay? All right, so good, we confirmed, confirmed a basic idea, and now we can go ahead and calculate the time for the messenger to travel the full length of the armada according to clocks in the armada, okay? Well here, the only difference is we use the length of the armada that it measures, the proper length, L sub naught, the full one light year. But we use the 0.625, so sure enough, there's more time passes. So people in the armada would have to wait 1.6 years for the messenger to get from the back to the front, okay? But what about the people on the, <clears throat> excuse me, on the ground base? What about them? Well, L relative to the rest frame S, the ground base, is just going to be the proper length divided by the Lorentz factor to give us the length of the armada according to the rest frame, okay? So how, how long is the armada according, according to the rest frame, in other words, okay? Well, it should be contracted, and indeed, it's only 0.61 light years long. So it's even shorter than the messenger sees it. And that's because the, the magnitude of the relative velocity between the ground base and the armada is greater than the magnitude of the relative velocity of the messenger to the armada, okay? In other words, um, 0.8 is larger than 0.625, okay? So good, so we got our contracted length is according to the rest frame, contraction of the, of the proper length, Thus, the time for ground, the time it takes for the messenger to travel from the rear to the front, is just the length that the ground measures divided by the difference between the velocities. Huh, which is just the velocity that were given in the statement of the problem. But why, do, why can we get away with that? Why don't we have to worry about finding more relative velocities? Well, because after all, we, the two velocities that were given, which I stated as being interesting, are both given relative to S. So in fact, the easiest calculation is part C. We could have done part C first, okay? But we didn't, okay? So we'll take the contracted length of the armada, take the difference between the velocity of the messenger relative to the ground and the armada relative to the ground, and get our value. And it turns out that four years pass, okay, for the messenger to go from the rear of the armada to the front according to people on the ground. Okay, very cool. So definitely combining ideas of length contraction, time dilation with relative velocities. Okay, so now let's move on to momentum. So an extremely fast moving proton has a momentum of 2.51 times 10 to the negative 17 net Newton seconds, which doesn't seem like a large value for momentum, but you gotta remember this is just a single proton. So this is a lot of momentum for one proton. What are the proton's speed V in the Earth frame and the Lorentz factor gamma? How long does it take this proton to travel across the Milky Way? Because once you find its speed, then we can do that calculation as measured in the Earth frame. And how long does it take to make that trip in the proton's frame? Okay, so let's see. So this is, uh, we are gonna start with our new material, relativis relativistic momentum, and then we'll tie it in with previous material in parts B and C, because that's a throwback to stuff from lecture 29. Okay, so here's our calculation for relativistic momentum, which is just P equals gamma MV, okay? And now I'm just going to go ahead and start solving for V, okay? Because you think about the expression, we were given P in this particular example, we obviously know C, we know the mass of the proton, that's a, a well-known constant, Okay, and we need to solve for V. So I gotta isolate V, but V is in you know, both the, the denominator inside the square root and it's up top in the numerator, so we gotta do some algebra. So one of the first things I'm gonna do is I'm going to um, square both sides. So right, right here, I'm gonna square both sides. That gets rid of the square root. Then, and that's what you see here, then I'm gonna raise both sides to the power of negative one, which I show in the gray, okay? So then that gives this expression. I'm gonna move both the terms that have the V in them to the same side so I can factor out the V, all right? Then I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna factor out the V. Then I'm actually going to isolate it by dividing both sides by this expression in the parentheses and taking the square root of both sides. So I get V all by itself. 
So now we have a nice expression here of velocity as a function of mass and momentum, okay? So we'll just plug in our values. Of course, we plug in the constant for the speed of light. We plug in the momentum that was given. I'll zoom in a bit on this so you can see, right? Um, the momentum, there's the, the given momentum. And we plug in the mass of a proton, which is 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. Make sure, make sure to square everything that's squared. And we get our final velocity, and it's basically the speed of light, right? Because this truly is a highly energetic uh, proton, okay? So just to know the speed of light, I included more significant figures just to show where it differs, okay? So that's a, we can go ahead and solve for the Lorentz factor in that case, solve for gamma, and we get 50. That's a big Lorentz factor, okay? You know, five is a big Lorentz factor, 50 is huge. Okay, so to the proton, the galaxy has what length? Well, we'll do length contraction. We're gonna take the length of the galaxy in, its, in the, its own rest frame, so its proper length, and divide by the gamma factor, right? The Lorentz factor. And then we find that in the reference frame of this highly energetic proton, the galaxy is only, well, it's less than 2,000 light years across, right? That's a big difference, okay? It went from 100,000 light years across to less than 2,000 light years, a lot of contraction. All right, and in meters, that's 1.9 times 10 to the 19 meters, and that's because a light year is about 946 trillion meters, or 9.46 times 10 to the 15 meters, okay? All right, so, and notice I did part C first, and that's because it was actually easier to do the length contraction before I, uh, before I answer the question of how long does it take, right? So I cheated and did part C first. But now that we have how long the galaxy is according to the reference frame of the proton, then we can easily find out how long it takes for the proton to travel the galaxy in its own reference frame. Because it's just going to be the length of the galaxy in its reference frame divided by its velocity, okay? And that's its velocity, just its, its relativistic, relativistic velocity, okay? And so it would take about 6.2 times 10 to the 10 seconds, which if we convert that over to years is about 1,000, 956.1, which is actually really close to the distance in light years because after all, it is almost traveling at the speed of light. So it makes sense that it would take that long to travel the distance, okay? All right. Well, very good. Let's carry on to our next example, example four. A neutron has a speed of 0.66 C, all right? And we want to find the speed of an electron that has the same momentum as that neutron, okay? And then we want to find the speed of an electron that has the same kinetic energy as that neutron. And those will not be the same speeds. They're both gonna be fast, but they won't be the same, okay? And notice that this is a combination of colors here because it is both a momentum problem and a relativistic kinetic energy problem, okay? So how do we get this started? Well, we wanna find the Lorentz factor of the neutron. So based on a neutron that is traveling at this speed, we have a Lorentz factor of 1.33. It doesn't matter if it's a neutron, just anything traveling at the speed has a Lorentz factor of 1.33. All right, so then the momentum, using our, our relativistic momentum expression, expression, which is just gamma times mv, well, then we can just go in and plug, plug in for that. Notice v I'm expressing here is just a fraction of the speed of light. And there we get the actual value of momentum for this individual neutron, okay? And then notice the mass of the neutron, 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. Okay, basically the same as a proton. Thus, for the electron, what's going to be different? Well, the mass is going to be different, okay? So then we're going to write this out in terms of the momentum for the, um, for the electron, okay? And they, share, they, they share the same momentum, right? Because the whole point is we need a shared momentum between the neutron and the electron. They share the same momentum. But what's different is a different mass, thus a different velocity. So what I'm going to solve for here is the velocity again. So it's kind of similar to the last algebraic expression. I need to solve for the velocity of the electron. So we just work through our steps here to isolate our, the velocity of our electron. And indeed, it's the same algebra. So we've already done that, so I'm gonna skip ahead, okay? And if we plug in our values, and then we find out that it's basically the speed of light, okay? But that makes sense because the electron is about a thousand times less massive than the neutron. So to have the same momentum, it has to be going a lot faster. And that lot faster brings it right up to about basically the speed of light, okay? So it is not exactly equal to it, but it's it's close enough that it didn't even show up on my calculator as being different than this 3.00, which I used as my, my value to calculate, okay? But for B, we're gonna find a electron that has the same amount of kinetic energy instead of momentum. So here, we'll set up our expression for relativistic kinetic energy. Here is the gamma factor for the neutron, just like we did before. We'll go ahead and set up our kinetic energy, okay? We're going to then find the amount of kinetic energy all right, thus, we, and because we, we already know the, um, the Lorentz factor, 
Okay, so now I know I want to set this value equal to the kinetic energy of an electron. All right, so same sort of thing I did, I did before. We have a shared kinetic energy between the electron and the neutron, but now what's different is the mass and thus the, um, well, the velocity will differ. But here we're going to go ahead as an intermediate step, solve for gamma because the electron has its own Lorentz factor which will just be helpful for calculations. So I'm just gonna go ahead and solve, solve for gamma, which is easier, easier to do from this calculation or from this formula as written. And so then we find out that, that the gamma, the Lorentz factor for the electron is 86.3. Oh, that's, that's really cool, right? To, because when we change the mass so significantly, when we go from the much more massive neutron to the much less massive electron, our Lorentz factor goes from 1.33 to 86.3, big difference. Okay, and of course, a Lorentz factor like that is gonna correspond to a very fast velocity. So if we go ahead and plug it in and solve for V, which is all I'm doing here is just taking this familiar expression for the definition of the Lorentz factor, but solving it for V, which itself is kind of you know, definitely a helpful way to express it. Plug in our numbers, and we find out that, again, it's practically equal to C. Okay? All right. So let's move on to our next example. More about relativistic kinetic energy. What is the work that must be done to increase the speed of an electron? Okay? Here's the mass of the electron, which we used in previous problems, but to increase it from 0.9 to 0.999. Okay? So... And again, that, that's a big step because you're not going 10% faster, you're going way faster because of that, that, rel that, relativism, that relative amount of energy it takes to get there, okay? So, the, but what is interesting and very important is the work energy theorem still applies. We can still say that work is equal to the change in kinetic energy, even if it's relativistic change in kinetic energy, okay? So that means that we'd have a K final term and a K initial term. So a final kinetic energy and an initial kinetic energy. Here's just the expression of final relativistic kinetic energy. Here's the expression of initial relativistic kinetic energy. What's nice too is it simplifies because the ones will cancel out. So we just have to consider the Lorentz factors for each. All right. And the Lorentz factors, we can just calculate like this because they're both given as a fraction of C. So C cancels out. Notice here I'm writing the one over the square root part as just one minus V squared over C squared to the negative one half because that, that power is the same as writing one of the square root. All right, and then I just plug in all my numbers, enter that in the calculator, although it, it is nice to show the change in the Lorentz factor because the Lorentz factor for a velocity of 0.9c is only 22.4, which is still pretty large. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, no, no, the other way around. The Lorentz factor for this one, 0.999, so 99.9% .9 the speed of light, that's the big one, 22.4. That is a large Lorentz factor. But for 90% the speed of light, it's 2.29, okay? So it's good to get a sense of you know how how these values change because they're good. It's obviously not linear, right? This is it, they're shooting up to infinity, okay? And then we just multiply by the mass of the electron, multiply by the speed of light squared, and we get our amount of energy: 1.65 times 10 to the negative 12 joules. Doesn't seem like a lot of energy, but just as I kind of said before, this is for an individual particle. In this case, shoot, an individual electron, right? Really small, and so it's actually a lot of energy to impart to just one electron. Okay, so now let's do another one. This one, uh, we don't, don't need a lot of space here, so I use, I, use, I use it very liberally. If the kinetic energy of a particle is equal to its rest energy, then its speed must be what? So this is a, a general question. I'm going to apply to any particle, okay? So here it's pretty neat. We're just going to set our expression for relativistic kinetic energy equal to rest energy. See that? All I'm saying is just K equals E rest. All right? Great. Okay? So when we... Set that up, we can see, well, this is gonna simplify nicely, isn't it? First thing we do is just cancel out the MC squared. So it's totally independent of the speed of light itself, and it's also independent of the mass. So then it just becomes gamma minus one equals one. Obviously, we can just add one to both sides, so we just get gamma equals two, okay? But then we have to reintroduce the dependence on the speed of light, because that doesn't go away, right? So I, you know, it, it looks like it might be independent of the speed of light, but of course it's not, right? Because it, it shows a beginning gamma. But what's nice now is we can definitely go ahead and simplify this really nicely, all right? Again, I'm writing the one over the square root as the negative one half power because then I can go ahead and raise both sides to the negative two power, which then if you think about the law of exponents, when you have a power raised to a power, that's like multiplication. So if you multiply negative one half times negative two, well, you could just, just get one. So that eliminates the power on, on the left-hand side of the equation. And then this over here, two to, the, two to the negative two power, well, two to the negative power is the same as one over two squared, which of course is just one over four. I'm just doing that as a reminder of, of exponents because I don't want that step to be overly confusing. All right, so then we see, it just simplifies to this with the one one fourth on the right hand side, and we just want to isolate our v. So we'll go ahead and um, you know subtract both terms from both sides. All right, and so then one minus one fourth of course is three quarters. Then I'm going to cross multiply to get v by itself. Take the square root of both sides, which means now I've isolated v, and we get that the velocity necessary to pull this off to have kinetic energy equal to rest energy 
is root 3 over 4 times c, which is 87% the speed of light. Okay? You know, not exactly, obviously, but close. All right? And that we could rewrite it and find the actual value, and it ends up being 260 million meters per second. Okay? Very cool. Let's do our final example, example 7. All right? So this one is going to be a throwback to ideas about the work done by an electric field, okay, on a charged particle. So if an electron at rest is suddenly subjected to an electric field of strength 8,000 newtons per coulomb, then what is the final velocity of the electron after it has moved 20 meters inside that constant field, all right, if we ignore special relativity, right? So this would be a problem we could have seen way back in, like, lecture three, okay? Now, part B what is the percent error between the final velocity of the electron found when we actually do consider special relativity and the one found in part A, okay? So let's see. So first let's ignore um, special relativity and just use our work energy theorem for electrostatics because the work done by a constant electric field is just the charge of the particle times the electric field, electric field strength times the distance moved to that field, QED, okay? And that must apply to kin kinetic energy, so it just equals one half mv squared, right? Mass of the electron and then v final is the final velocity. Okay, so then I'm gonna go ahead and then solve for the final velocity, right? Which is quite easy to simplify from this, okay? Plug in our values because we know, I'll zoom in a bit on this tab, we know that the charge of an electron is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. We're given the field strength, we're given the distance, and here we just plug in the mass of the electron, okay? All right, and the value we get is 2.37 times 10 to the eight meters per second, right? This is wrong, right? It's significantly wrong. It's not, there's no red flag here because it is less than the speed of light. So we're only going to answer that immediately, immediately seems physically impossible, but still we're close enough that we know that we're close, that we should consider relativity. Whenever you're this close to three times 10 to the eight meters per second, you, you know that there would be a significant percent error. And well, let's find just how significant it is. Okay. So considering special relativity, we have the following. We still have the work done by electric field is still QED, but of course now, we don't, we're not going to use classical uh, kinetic energy. Instead, we're going to use the expression that we just introduced in this lecture. Okay? And now we just have to do a bit more complicated algebra because we still have to isolate B. Okay? So you can see here, I just start to work it out. I'm just going to cross multiply by the M, e, or the M sub E squared. I'll just call it MC squared. So I just divide both sides by MC squared. Then I just add plus one to both sides. Okay? And that's what you see here. The very next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and um, square both sides because I want to get rid of the square root, and I'm going to find a common denominator for the expression on the right-hand side. That's all I've done here. And I've also um, made it so that my v squared over c squared term is on its own, okay? So a few steps embedded in one, but you can practice practice that for yourself, right? So then the last step is just to cross multiply and take um, take the square root. Of course, there's always that, that two steps, right? I have to square it to get rid of the root, but then I have to take the root to get the v by itself. Then we have our nice final expression, this is the velocity dependent on the electric field strength, distance, and a bunch of things, you know? So it is still a nice applicable um, expression. And we plug in all the values that were given in this problem, because at this point, these are all our known values. And what velocity do we get? 1.46 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, all right? So definitely on the same order of magnitude. They're both in the hundreds of millions of meters per second. But what's interesting is that one is 2.37, another is 1.46. So that's, that is a significant difference, right? How much so? Well, we do a percent error calculation. I called V final the classical calculation, the naive calculation. We called the one from relativity just V without a subscript. So we'd have the difference between V final minus V divided by the more reliable value V multiplied by 100 to get percent error. Um, since they're both on the order of 10 to the 8, we can just cancel those out. So it's just 2.37 minus 1.46 up in the numerator and then divide by 1.46. Turn into percentage and what do we get? 62%. That's a lot of percent error. So we certainly would want to consider relativity in order to get the right velocity. In this case, I'm an accelerating electron in a uniform electric field. Okay? All right. Well, I hope this lecture on relativity, our final lecture on special relativity, has been both interesting and informative. Thank you so much for watching.